Hello, I'm Roger Hansen. I'm the marketing coordinator at the Tri-State Warbird Museum. With me today is our special guest, Mr. Richard Hunt. Mr. Hunt was a Corsair pilot during the Second World War. Mr. Hunt, thank you for joining us. Very welcome. Uh, let's kind of start at the beginning. Uh, your life, uh, are you a Cincinnati area native? No, sir. My hometown is Washington, D.C. My dad was a dentist. He also had a boat, a family boat, a series of them. But the family boat that I remember and we had for 50-some years was a 36-footer on Chesapeake Bay. So uh, I felt very oriented to the Coast Guard, the Navy, and boating in general. And uh, I, when I got to college, I had joined the Army Reserve Corps, called it the ERC, Enlisted Reserve Corps. But that was to avoid the draft and preclude any chance of being taken by the draft from engineering school. So uh, when I decided to apply for the Navy in February 43, uh, I had to, I didn't realize it, but I had to get discharged from the Army before I could be sworn into the Navy. That took a few extra weeks, but that was, uh, you know, sort of routine. Did you join the Navy with the idea of going to flight school? Absolutely. Call the V-5 program. What was the one, if there is one, moment in your life that made you think, airplane, that's me, that's what I want to do? Well, uh, as, as a young guy, I built a number of models, mostly solid models, but as it turned out, they were all military. They were mostly fighters, and it, it's, that's what I had my mind on when I called upon the Navy and said, will you take me? And little did I know or have a realization that I would fly a Corsair, which was it, until I graduated from Pensacola, which was a couple of years down the road, and my assignment, my orders read uh, Corsairs at Jacksonville, which is operations training. So I was extremely pleased. I'm sure my dad was too. Was your dad a pilot? No. Let's uh, let's kind of take this the, the whole training command thing and take me back, 1943. You had just gotten out of the Army program, walked in the front gate at the Navy, and they said, hi. What happened then? Well, I, I was in my first year of engineering at Cornell. And when the Navy said, go ahead, they had representatives on the Cornell campus. They said, please report to Church Street, New York, and you will go through a battery of tests physical mostly, and other. So I did that. I took a Greyhound bus down to New York City, and I believe that we were there three days, if not three and a half. We went through all kinds of physical examinations, starting with the eyes, and even my teeth, which had had the advantage of orthodonture, uh, were considered to be fine, you know, had a good bite. That was the key criteria. Anyway, uh, I spent those all that time at, in New York, Church Street, <coughs> and when the Navy said, you who have succeeded in being accepted need to come to this small office, and I believe there were about 12 or 15 guys, which was a very small portion of the guys who had been through that place in those three days. In any event, he said, if any of you have ever been in the military, any military, any country, U.S. or otherwise, <coughs> pardon me, said, raise your hand. So there was one guy who raised his hand. That was yours truly. Why? Because I was a member of the Enlisted Reserve Corps, U.S. Army, and I was also in ROTC. And uh, for the sake of mentioning it, there was something that we used to indulge in called the Pershing Rifles, which was sort of a fancy uh, manual of arms syllabus that we all tried to do. But anyway, uh, there, there was no problem for me getting into 
the Navy B-5 program. I'm sure there were a lot of guys who were very disappointed. They were probably football players, athletes of various sorts, big guys, muscular. And I weighed at that time about 140. I weigh now about 135. That's because of lymphoma last year. But anyway, you know, I envied those guys who were big and muscular and looked like they would for sure be aviation cadets. But most of the ones that I observed did not make it for reasons of blood pressure or eyes, something else that the Navy was very particular about. So I was very lucky. The first thing that the military does uh, when they accept a young man or woman now into the flight program is there's an intensive ground school period. I think the Navy calls it pre-flight. What was that all about? Prep, prep flight was a more, uh, more initial, or what should I say, the more well-known name. That was several months before we learned to fly in Cubs in Virginia. We were at uh, Williamstown, in fact, Williams College, Massachusetts, way up in the northeast, no, I beg your pardon, the northwest corner. And I was lucky to have been a engineering student at Cornell for one year, even had a slide rule with me. And I, as it turned out, some of those fellows who had been accepted in the V-5 program were Navy personnel, but uh, they had been aboard ship. They had been in the Navy active duty for maybe four or five, six years. So they were older guys, maybe 25, 26. I was 19 at the time. And as it turned out, there, were, there was a lot of very fundamental and I would say uh, easy uh, things to learn about aviation, instruments, and aircraft, and air aircraft engines. And I was way ahead of the other guys, so I found myself being their mentors or their coaches, uh, not an instructor of any sort, but their coaches. I might mention also that in high school in Washington, D.C., I had been a cadet high school cadet for three years. Had a lot of experience in that, even some publicity by newspapers, me marching down the field. In any event, that qualified me to do something that it was suggested to me I never do, and that was to volunteer for something. And when we got up to prep flight school or prep uh, Williamstown Mass, there was, there was a, a request for somebody who was very familiar with drill, who could take this platoon of maybe 30 or 40 guys and drill them, teach them to drill, teach them what soldiering is all about. I did that by volunteering, and I never regretted it. As it turned out, as it turned out, uh, I ended up being in charge of that same group when they were transferred by train from Williamstown, Mass, down to Blacksburg, Virginia, which was VPI campus and airport where we learned to fly in Cubs. But I was, I was the guy in charge. Hey, 30 or 40 guys, you know, because they all got off at Elizabeth, New Jersey, and it's pretty hard to round them up. That, that's heady stuff for a 19-year-old. Well. We have here, <coughs> here, I'll let you hold it up and okay. show it. Uh, it's Piper Cub. That was the kind of airplane that you first started flying, correct? Yep. With civilian instructors. 65 horsepower, very slow, and, you know, probably did 80 at best. But uh, it was a, a great airplane. There was a seat in front, seat in back, so called tandem. And the instructor would sit in back, the, the student pilot would sit in front. And I can remember. Nothing very particular except that on one occasion when we were doing a simulated forced landing, everything was going all right. Apparently my approach was okay. All of a sudden, the tail wheel caught a telephone wire or electrical wire, and of course it lurched. And <laughs> the instructor said, don't worry about that. So we, we, we goofed up somebody's telephone line or electric. And uh, that was the only experience I ever had with a, with a cub, 
that was something to remember. And it was your first arrested lending. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Thank heaven, no. It was, it was in a cornfield, or oh, adjacent okay. to a cornfield. But it was a great airplane. I think I had 38 hours in it or something like that. And from the Cub, you went to the Stearman, I believe, correct? No. As a matter of fact, while we were at the Cub place, in other words, BPI, Blacksburg, Virginia, I had, I had gotten the flu on Christmas Eve, 1943, and therefore was held back, put in sick bay. I think sick bay was uh, three, to, three to four or five days. And then since the class had gone on ahead of me, uh, I had something like a week or week and a half with nothing to do, really. And they, the Navy at uh, BPI, which was a full lieutenant and a lieutenant JG, and I'm not sure about the other guy, but the, the guy who was in charge of everything, the, ca the uh, lieutenant, asked me if I would like to check out in N3Ns. N3Ns are built by the Navy. They look a lot like a Stearman. They're a little larger. Stearman had 220 horsepower, and this was... Let me pick it up and show everybody. Th this was the airplane in which we had primary. That was uh, up at Glenview, Illinois. But uh, this airplane had two, 220 horsepower. The, the uh, Stearman, uh, the uh, N3N, which was Navy built, and they had maybe three or four there, was 235 horsepower more horsepower, and a little heavier. So I had the opportunity that none of the other guys had, which was to check out in and fly the N3N. And I did that there at Blacksburg, Virginia, for the balance of the time that I had to wait to go with the next, next class. And uh, I think I got something like 11 hours in the N3N. But you know, that was a fun thing. Uh, when I had been checked out or soloed, I was flying around. This was wintertime, open cockpit, just like Stearman, and uh, had a, an awful lot of gear on, you know, heavyweight stuff. But I was chasing trains and doing all kinds of things that are fun. So that was a real bonus. <coughs> oh, excuse me. From the uh, from the Stearman, you went from there to the T6, SNJ? Yeah. The Stearman was primary training. That was about four months' worth, and there were several stages to primary, one of which was aerobatics and uh, night flying. Uh, it's worth mentioning that when I had my first night hop, got back and landed. I scraped the wingtip. Very easy to do with a narrow landing gear. And I don't know who was out there watching. Maybe an officer, maybe not. Maybe an instructor. But anyway, he said, stay in the cockpit. And they wheeled that plane into the hangar. And they proceeded where the, where the uh, handle is. You know, there's a handle on each lower wing. But they proceeded to sand it and put more clip tall or varnish, whatever it was. And they said, go back and fly again. So, you know, it was uh, maybe a 10 or 15 minute recess. I never got out of the airplane. I mean, I remember also uh, one time when I was not flying, but at the field, when a, series, a group of thunderstorms came up. I call it a line of thunderstorms. And the turbulence and the drafts were so severe that I watched planes like this, at least a dozen of them, go flying up into the air simply because they had not, they had not been tied down. Nobody had the opportunity to tie them down with that thunderstorm coming. So if you can imagine, this was about a 3,000-pound airplane, maybe more, and they were flying all over the place. You know, the wind picked them up and put them in the air. So they lost quite a few, maybe six or eight that day, that afternoon. Let's fast forward a little bit in the training. Uh, you ended up, you were talking about the uh, the Corsair, the F4U. Uh -huh. uh, 
Tell us about that airplane. Well, the F4U was that which I really wanted to get to, and I thought the chances were something like maybe one in ten or something else because they had Navy pilots flying float planes, N3Ns with floats, and uh, they were flying a lot of different fighters, Wildcats, F4F, mm -hmm. Hellcats, F6S, which was a later one. And I might add that the Hellcat had the same engine as the Corsair, 2,000 horsepower. But anyway, when I requested at Pensacola upon graduation, getting into a Corsair flight training program, they, they gave me orders. They didn't talk to me, they just gave me orders for F4U at Jacksonville. And this is a good representation of an F4U up in the clouds where we often were. Of course, the Marines probably flew the Corsair considerably more than the Navy because the Marines were land-based and the Navy did not think the Corsair was qualified for the carrier until about 1944, maybe late 43. So all the Corsairs that were in there fighting were flown by Marines from land base. The, the training that you went through for the F4U, obviously mm -hmm. that was the, the, the aircraft checkout. Did you do your carrier qualifications in that aircraft, in the Corsair? In order to qualify for this, I had 9.1 hours in the back seat of an SNJ. In other words, you normally fly the SNJ from the front seat, right. and we did a great deal. Had a lot of hours in these. But to qualify for the Corsair, you had to sit in the back, fly the airplane from the back, experience the long nose and the lack of visibility. So that's precisely what we did, nine hours worth. Here, let me, here, let me help you with this. The, the SNJ, which we flew at Pensacola, really was a bloody baron, as they called it. And that was because... Oh, yeah. I'll take that. Don't there we go. There we go. Uh, it was called Bloody Baron because there were a lot of instructors who were completely bored with what was going on. And uh, this is the way the story goes. And those guys did all kinds of things that were dangerous. They probably shouldn't have done. Uh, you know, a lot of low passes and maybe even some dog fights. In any event... The Navy lost quite a few cadets as a result of these instructors doing things that were unwarranted and uh, inappropriate. So I don't recall how much time. I think we had about a 115 hours in SNJs. We did gunnery with these. We flew night at night. We even flew instruments, not much, but some. This was a great airplane, 600 horsepower. It could do almost anything. And today there are a lot of these flying, and uh, they are definitely in the aerobatic category. So there are a lot of doing aerobatics these days. If you want to see one flying, we have one here, of course, but uh, they are very numerous, unlike Corsairs. The, uh, the, the training in the Corsair. Did they emphasize air to air, air to ground, or were you even at that stage at that point? Oh, yeah. They emphasized both. Uh, my logbook would reveal the stages we had, but we had gunnery with 50 caliber, 650 caliber machine guns. We had a bit of navigation. We had formation flying, which was very necessary. And we had glide bombing. We had dive bombing which means you get up there uh, somewhere around three or 4,000 feet and come down virtually on your back because even with dive brakes, which was the landing gear, the main gear, in order to resist it overspeeding mm -hmm. and the engine overspeeding, you, you had dive brakes which limited the airspeed and you were invariably on your back. 
when you're aiming for something straight down. And we pulled out at 1,500 feet, and uh, there was, you know, it was obvious that if you pulled out at 1,500 feet and never touched the water, which was the bogey, uh, you're going to have G-forces uh, really blacking you out, and that blackout would last for probably 10 seconds, as much as 10 seconds. In other words, you blacked out, and then you suddenly grayed out. You can't see a thing. No instruments, no nothing like that. So you really have to get used to that dive bombing. That was a chore, or let's say that was a fundamental thing that since the Corsair was called a fighter bomber and the pilots were earned the reputation or the qualification of fighter bomber pilots, you had to be able to do all the exercises in, in bombing. Uh, I guess it had low level bombing and glide bombing and dive bombing. So we did all of those. It's so not near as much fun as the air to air, is it? Pardon? Is it as much fun as the air to air dogfighting? No, but I learned something from air to air. We did quite a bit of that. And the thing I learned was having been trained to get out of a spin or potential spin, which means a stall and a fall up. I experienced when I was in a very tight left turn trying to catch up with somebody, probably at about three or 4,000 feet. All of a sudden, the plane, which was in a steep left bank, maybe 60 degrees, suddenly flipped. You know, no notice at all. And all of a sudden, I was in a spin to the right. And I had never experienced that in any airplane, not even a Corsair. But the training, which tells you how to get out of a potential spin or a spin, you know, it's just like nothing. You, you, do what you, you do what you learn to do, and that was it. My uh, Air Force friends will disagree, but uh, I think it's pretty well acknowledged that the Navy turns out perhaps the best pilots because of landing on the aircraft carriers, and that's something else you had to do. Yep. What's Four that? Fourteen landings and takeoffs. Talk us through that in just well, a couple of minutes. Uh, we, we had field carrier practice. In other words, there was a designated pattern on, on a field, and uh, we had to land. We were following instructions of the landing signal officer, LSO, and we had to land within a short a distance. They had cables on that field. The thing we didn't like about it, it was on land and therefore a lot of turbulence around the field. And there was one guy, uh, I remember his name, it was Brown. He somehow battered up or crashed his airplane. I don't know what his problem was, but he, he kept the runway inactive or let's say occupied for quite a while. And during their cleaning up his airplane, somebody called me on the radio, and we were right there at the field, and said, Hunt, you're, you're losing oil or something, a lot of black smoke coming from your aircraft. So I watched the gauge, oil gauge, and indeed, the gauge was going down. So I called into the LSO and tried to get permission to land. And there were three runways there. He never gave me permission. That is not in my logbook, and I believe it's because he was ultimately embarrassed because he was a plane in distress, losing oil, and he, he didn't let it land. As it, as it turned out, the engine froze at about two or 300 feet, and I landed on one runway that he didn't give me permission to, but you know it was not the one that was uh, occupied by the wrecked airplane. So I did a dead stick landing. I don't know anyone else who has had that experience. And, yeah. and landing and taking off from the aircraft carrier. Well, on the aircraft carrier, first we, we did 14 landings and takeoffs. And the first landing I made, the guy on the bullhorn on the Koning Tower called something down to me as I was taxiing from the uh, from the landing, immediate landing area. 
And I, asked, I had to ask the mech who was up on the wing right away, what did he say? And what he said was, you were lucky. You have a flat tailwheel tire. The tailwheel tires were, were pneumatic, so you know, they inflated. And why I had it, why that particular instance ended up in a flat tire, I don't know. Could have been a defective or worn out tire. And it could be because we learned in making Nate, learn, let's say, in making carrier landing to get that tail, tail down. If you don't get the tail down first, you go bouncing merrily up into the barricade. So uh, I, I always got the tail down. Maybe a little hard. But anyway, you know, I, it's not in my log book, and I never had any any talk about it, and no, no uh, detrimental talk. Well, unfortunately, uh, we're fighting the clock. Uh, Richard Hunt, thank you very much You're for joining most us. Welcome. Uh, once again, I'm Roger Hansen coming to you from the Tri-State Warbird Museum. And uh, today, we had Mr. Richard Hunt sharing his stories and experiences with us as a Navy pilot. Thank you very much.